After exploring the drug ruins on Cistern Key, link provided above, we were excited to search for the ruins of Carlos Leiter's houses on Norman Key, the center for his drug smuggling operations in the early 1980s. I found a blog post from 2007 with the Google satellite image showing the location of one of Leiter's houses. I was able to find what appeared to be the same location from a current Google satellite image, but before we show you what we found at that location, we're going to talk about a navigational issue we addressed. Before Jim gets into too much detail about what is wrong with our AIS. I'm going to tell you what AIS is. AIS is short for Automated Identification System, which allows voters to see and identify vessels in the immediate vicinity that are broadcasting an AIS signal. Voters can choose to have an AIS receiver, which receives AIS data, and or an AIS transponder, which broadcasts AIS data, such as a boat's heading, name, and length over VHF frequencies. We're going to go up to the chart plotter now because I'm going to show you some of the AIS data that we can receive. Here at the chart plotter, I can use the touch screen to click on a vessel that is transmitting AIS data, and this pulls up an AIS target box with the vessel name, CPA, which is the closest point of approach, and SOG, the speed over ground of the vessel. To pull up additional information, I can click on View AIS Data on the touch screen and this will provide additional information such as the vessel type, here a sailing vessel, and the length and beam of the vessel. We've been struggling with our AIS. What do you think is wrong with it? It was working fine and we crossed a sheet over the coaxial cable going into the mast and it put a lot of pressure on the coaxial cable and it crushed it and it's put additional resistance in the wire and the resistance lowers the output of the antenna. So. Our AIS is struggling to be seen beyond, say, two nautical miles. So we just need to replace that coax cable. But as I've learned more, Ray Marine, the producer of this AIS product, the maximum length for the antenna is 30 feet that they sell. But since ours goes up the mast, it's more like a 70 feet. So I'm talking with a level two advisor for Ray Marine to figure out what's the proper coaxial cable that will both shield the output of the antenna as it goes through the wire up to the antenna and back down again, but also doesn't create too much resistance because not only is the break in the coaxial cable a problem, but maybe the length is too long for the cable, which also limits the output and we're going to fix both hopefully at the same time. What was our normal range? You said it, we only see about two nautical miles. It's not. It's more complicated than that. The AIS systems will only see so many transponders before the computer maxes out and unless we're doing either coastal sailing or blue water sailing, which we don't do a whole lot of, we really can't tell how far it goes for regular sailboats. In the past, I think we were getting five nautical miles, which is good. AISs are not all built the same. When we go by a super tanker, their AIS has a much higher wattage output. And so we can see them even now for five nautical miles, where before I think we could probably see them nine to 10 nautical miles. We're deciding not to get this done in the Bahamas. Why did we make that decision? Nobody there, no materials there, no knowledge there. So how are we gonna struggle by? How do you think that's going to work? Well, it's pretty easy. We have the AIS. It um, just means we need to be aware that we need to be watching it more often because it basically won't work past, uh, say, two nautical miles. And then second of all, we have an easy backup, and that is turning on our radar. For coastal sailing and blue water sailing, which we're doing, mostly you turn on the radar, and the radar will be able to pick up vessels. Radar serves two functions, one to show weather, and another is to show different masses in the water. And our radar is extremely good at picking up even the smallest vessels in the water. In fact, if you're really going to do the most safe sailing you can, you turn on your AIS, and all other boats that have AIS will communicate, and you'll see each other. But there's a whole lot of boats, especially small recreational boats, fishing vessels, none of them have AIS. So you can't see those. Radar, when it's tuned right, can even see small 10-foot vessels that are a mile away. That's what we have as backup since our AIS is not working perfectly. We wake up to another beautiful Bahamian day, perfect for sailing. 
From Allen's Keys, we sail eight nautical miles to anchor on the northwest side of Norman's Key. As mentioned earlier, we chose this location because it appeared to be the location where ruins of one of Carlos Letter Rivas' houses existed in 1987. However, in approaching the house in our dinghy, we did not find a ruined drug lord's house, but rather structures in good condition with several private property signs posted near the houses. Our plans to explore ruined buildings dashed. We take the lab mariners for a walk on the beach. So while we walk the dogs along the beach, let me give you a little history lesson in case you're unfamiliar with Carlos Leder. Carlos Leder was born in Colombia and moved to the U.S. with his mother when he was 15. He turned to crime and was imprisoned for car theft where he met George Young. Young had experience smuggling marijuana by flying small aircraft below radar level from Mexico to U.S. In 1978, Carlos later started buying up large parcels of property on Norman's Key. His plan was to revolutionize the cocaine trade by using a similar technique in which drugs were smuggled out of Colombia by small aircraft into Norman's Key. Norman's Key served as a stopover and refueling point before the drugs were smuggled into the U.S. Later continued buying parcels of land and harassing the residents until Norman's Key became his own private island. In 1982, the Bahamian government began cracking down on the activities at Norman's Key and later fled to Colombia. In 1983, the Bahamian government froze Later's bank accounts and seized his property. After several years of negotiations with Colombia, Later was arrested and extradited into the U.S. for trial. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole plus 135 years, which was later reduced to 55 years after he testified in the drug trafficking trial of Panamanian dictator Muriel Noriega. He was released in June of 2020, 33 years after his arrest in Colombia. He was then escorted into Germany, where he was handed over to the German authorities. Finished with our walk, we head back to Lab Mariner on our dinghy, with plans to visit a plane wreck associated with drug smuggling tomorrow. From our anchorage on the northwest side of Norman's Key, we sail five nautical miles to the south side of the key. This is the location of the plane wreck we plan to snorkel, and because we've arrived at low tide, a portion of the plane can be seen above the water. So where are we, Jim? We are at the southernmost part of Norman Key. We're right near the drug plane that flopped belly first into the water. The C-46 Yes, and we are waiting for slack tide, which just a few minutes ago, we were shown that that was a smart move since they had to kind of quietly go rescue someone that couldn't get back to their vessel against the tide. Yeah, it seems like the current's pretty strong here. We have a short swim over there, so, and it's gonna be at slack tide, so it should be easy. Right, and so we are preparing to jump in the water, swim, 300 feet over, go check out the uh, submerged plane, and then hopefully come back without much current. Do you know anything about Norman Ski? It was owned by a drug smuggler in the 80s. and uh, Carlos Later. Okay. And he was uh, arrested in the 80s, and the island now has a beautiful uh, large airport, has a, a nice restaurant, and uh, they are trying to uh, make it into a destination location, but right now it's just with us and about five other boats. <laughs> I don't know if the airstrip was the same one that they used during the uh, drug smuggling years or if it's a new airport. I doubt that. If you look at Google Maps, it is very nicely done. Um, it is a professionally uh, well-maintained airport. Ah, okay. Yes, Carlos later was actually he was extradited to the U.S. when he was arrested, and he just got out in 2020, so recently. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll see him if we go onto the island. <laughs> no, no, he he had see you, he, Carlos. He lost the property. It, it went to the, it went back to the Bahamian government. I understand that, but that doesn't stop him from going. Okay. We'll see you, Carlos.
Join us next week when we sail to Shroud Key, where after walking the Lab Mariners on one of the white sand beaches, Jim and I paddleboard through the mangroves and do a little surfing with our dinghy on the sound side of the key.